Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife was hiding something from her husband while he was away on business trips, but what was it? Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy it! My name is Clinton Corners. I am 35 years old, and at the beginning of this story, I was confused and angry. However, these were the only things I knew about my situation. Of course, there were other things going on in my life, but at that moment, I was blissfully unaware of how stupid I looked. Looking around the small airport terminal, I was still amazed at how my boss had convinced me to be there at that moment, doing what I was doing. It was an autumn Friday morning, the day after Thanksgiving, and everyone else in our company, like most Americans, was relaxing. Yet here I stood in this tiny terminal, waiting for an even smaller plane that would take me north to Canada. My goal was to make a deal with a small Canadian manufacturing company that could subcontract the production of our parts. The company, Northstar Manufacturing, supposedly had the latest state-of-the-art CNC and robotic systems that were more advanced than what we had in our area. According to what I could gather from people working with them, the company only had five or six employees. I wasn't entirely sure how such a small company could handle the volume of parts we needed, but my boss insisted that I go and study their work. I still remember the conversation that distracted me from the celebrations the night before. In a way, I was glad for the distraction. Eight of us, me, my wife Kathy, my brother Chuck and his wife Annie, my parents, and Kathy's parents, had just started discussing my mother's favorite topic, so, when will I get grandchildren from you too, she asked. Her question prompted Kathy's mother to join the discussion in full agreement. Everyone looked at me, the smirk on my father's face told me that he was enjoying watching me squirm under my mother's relentless questions. Just as I started to open my mouth to shift the blame onto Kathy, the phone rang. Kathy rushed toward it with almost supernatural agility, taking the phone with her into the kitchen. Her smug smile made me realize that she had deliberately left me to my mother's interrogation. However, just a few seconds after her triumphant departure, she returned to the room, frowning. This is for you, honey, she said, handing me the phone. This is Frank. Frank stood for Frank Walters, my boss and owner of the engineering company I worked for. Only Frank could call me on a holiday during dinner. Frank lived, ate, and breathed work. He was probably already tired of all his relatives and decided to contact me to continue discussing his next project. For the first time, I was glad that he thought of me. Yes, Frank. Happy Thanksgiving to you too, I said into the phone. Clint, my boy, I've been thinking, he said. Listen, I don't want to ruin Turkey Day for you, but I need you to come to the office tomorrow morning. I have another brilliant idea. Even when I hung up the phone, I knew I was going to hate his brilliant idea, but I used this call as a distraction. I pretended that I needed to go to our home office to get an important email. Alone in the office, I checked my personal email and played a few games until I heard the sounds of at least one parent getting ready to leave. I made it downstairs just in time to see the door closing behind them, with my parents getting ready to leave as well. I can't believe he's calling you on holiday, my father said. What a slave owner! Yes, but someday I will leave the company, I said. He has no sons, and his daughter is not interested in business. She'll probably marry someone who will, said my father. It's unlikely to happen, I said. She stands firmly on the side of the gaze. Well, maybe your partner will be interested in business after all, said my father. It doesn't matter, I replied. Frank is such a homophobe that he would never hand over a business to a girl who is into girls. I just hope Frank appreciates all the dedication and commitment you show, my father finally said. Anyway, this morning I found myself in Frank's office, listening to him explain this little trip to Canada to me. Completing this trip would earn me a bonus and a company paid trip to Hawaii for me and Kathy. One of the things I liked about Frank was that he demanded a lot from his employees but also gave a lot in return. This trip, for example, he arranged for me to fly on a small private business jet. It was a first-class luxury aircraft that could accommodate no more than 15 passengers at a time. I would avoid long check-in lines, all seats on the plane were comfortable and well-appointed, and I wouldn't have to deal with screaming children or problem passengers. Frank also arranged for me to stay in a first-class hotel with all the amenities. He even said that I could take Kathy with me. When I told her about it, 
Kathy looked at me with sympathy and just shook her head. It won't work, cowboy, she smiled. I love you to bits, honey, and I hate that you have to do this on your day off. But remember, you're working hard now so that later, when we're older, we can retire early and travel the world together. However, tomorrow is Black Friday. I won't miss all the sales to wander around Canada with you, so call me off and get back to me as soon as possible. But I won't go with you. The whole day had gone smoothly so far. There was no snow yet, which was unusual for November in Michigan. Temperatures were in the upper 40s and low 50s, so I took advantage of the situation and drove my Mustang. I liked that the airline offered indoor secure parking, this made me feel confident that my Mustang would be safe and looked after while I was away. I was only going to be gone for a couple of days, but I was still worried about my car. However, with this concern addressed, everything was taken care of, and all I had to worry about was the task ahead. The procedure for boarding the plane was different. I simply showed up in the hangar at the moment when the plane was about to take off. There was no ticket, I simply showed my driver's license as proof of identity. The woman checked my name on the list, and I boarded the plane. There were already several people on board. The two of them sitting separately were typical business types in dark suits. Both were already sitting with their laptops and barely glanced up when I entered the cabin. Another couple was clearly a businessman and his secretary. They seemed to be traveling on business. However, their expressions told a different story. There was a gray, elderly woman reading a magazine and, finally, a couple of guys who appeared to be some kind of technicians. I sat in the middle of the plane, mainly because it was away from everyone else. A few moments after I boarded, a loud old man with two young men, who were clearly his subordinates, came on board. They loudly discussed everything that came to their minds. Several other passengers looked up, but the oldest among them only glared back. He was clearly too rude to care about the discomfort of the people around him. Just as the woman with the list checked it again and did a visual roll call, another woman slid through the doorway. Almost every head turned when she entered. She didn't look like Kathy at all, she was unlike any girl I had ever dated. Kathy was taller, slimmer, more my type, or at least that's what I thought until now. But in less than a second after seeing this woman, my opinion changed. I also felt a flash of anger after I saw her. Kathy suddenly seemed incomplete, or to put it in third grade math parlance, my wife suddenly seemed less. A couple of years ago, Kathy had breast augmentation surgery. She didn't make them bigger, just fuller, she wasn't worth it. The woman who just came on board made all these types and comparisons irrelevant. Although she was completely covered up to the neck, it was impossible to hide the amount of flesh under her blouse. As she turned to look for a seat, all the blood in my brain instantly rushed to the other head. Her legs, plump and graceful, served for more than just movement, they were the guardians of the promised land. All this abundant loveliness was packed into a woman who was only 5 feet 2 inches tall, if that. However, these curves and what they promised faded before her eyes. Even from across the room, those eyes attracted me. I was locked in her gaze like a moth to a flame. It was only when I realized I had to look away that I recognized the intimacy of our eye contact was wrong in its intensity. I realized that I had deceived myself. Every man on that plane, and some of the women, also thought that she had eyes for them and them only. Sitting there, dazed with growing anger, the loud-voiced guy was already on his feet and heading toward her. His sneer turned into a disgusting expression as he approached her, but she was much faster at understanding the situation than anyone in the room. Before he could clear his throat to speak, she turned abruptly and sat down in the seat next to me. Is there someone sitting here? she asked. I was too stunned to curse. I quickly shook my head, indicating that no one was sitting there. Her voice was more musical than anything that had been released since Motown. Again, I felt a flash of anger. It wasn't directed at her, no, the anger was directed at myself. At 35 years old, I had never thought about cheating on Katie until that day. I just wasn't the type of person to leave my responsibilities. But from the moment she stepped onto that plane, all the stupid love songs I'd heard my entire life suddenly made sense. What made it even worse was that I was sure she didn't feel even the slightest bit of excitement that she caused in my mind, spirit, and pants. The loud-voiced guy returned to his charges, giving me a look that could melt tungsten. Would you like to sit by the window? 
I asked timidly. Why not, dear? She smiled. I always like to see where I'm going. You're such a nice young man. Until that moment, I had never considered her age. At that point, I began to wonder if age matters when it comes to women. Damn, let's be honest, beauty is beauty, and a woman of such beauty transcends her age. However, it made me wonder how old she really was. Returning to my generous act, I actually gave her the window seat so she could be all mine for the short duration of the flight. If she was sitting in an aisle seat, half the plane might come over to chat with her, but this way, I had her to myself, and everything would be much more comfortable. As the plane's engines began to get louder, I looked at her carefully. Many questions arose in my head. How old is she really? What does she do? I noticed several small rings on her slender fingers, but not a single wedding or engagement ring. At that moment, the ring securely attached to my left fourth finger suddenly became heavier and hotter. Focusing on the ring and the image of Katie, faithful and waiting for me at home, I was able to tear myself away from the woman next to me and pull out my iPad to look up information about the company I was about to visit. As the plane began to move down the runway, I tried my best to focus on my work and not on the woman next to me. I also told myself that I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't even touch this woman. I didn't do anything to hurt Katie. All I did was get a little lost in my thoughts. My marriage was still as secure as it was that morning. I didn't really betray Katie. Besides, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. I told myself it was just a momentary pang of guilt. I'd experienced them many times over the years, so experiencing it alone with Kyle quickly approaching me was nothing new. I usually dealt with them by being extra loving toward Katie for a few days. Most people I know think Clint and I have the perfect life. We have all the attributes of a successful couple, a beautiful house, I chose it, and Clint works like hell to make sure I have almost everything I need. We will be adding a couple of children to our lineup in the near future, and in the end, we will retire rich, fat, and happy. Maybe we'll travel and see some of those exotic places everyone always talks about, or maybe we'll just keep doing whatever makes us happy. Most people I know would be horrified to know what I do. The thought of me having affairs, or even one affair, would paint me as some kind of scarlet woman. Okay, let's be honest, they would declare me the worst woman to appear in our city in a millennium. But in the real world, all my friends would immediately start hunting for my husband. Single men would try to get into his bed before my scent disappeared from the sheets. Married women would spend a little more time with him, and most of my male friends would start aiming to be the next one to sleep with me if they could do it without being noticed. None of them would want to marry me, but they would all want to sleep with someone available for a change. Most people I know are sheep. They go through their lives with their eyes closed. They want all the things that everyone else wants. There is not a single original thought among them. They live their lives according to some old saying, happy wife, happy life and all that crap. The problem was that I wasn't happy, not at all. I married Clint with the best expectations, however, somewhere along the line, I simply grew tired of being second or maybe even third in his life. Frank was number one, maybe not even Frank, but just a damn job. My husband was not as dedicated to my happiness as he was to his job. Giving me all the things he gave me was just a byproduct of his success at work. But after a while, things stopped making me happy. I craved attention, and if it didn't come from my husband, well, if you can't be with the one you love. Kyle ran up to me as if he was dying without me. I missed you so much, he said. Oh God, Kyle, I smiled. You act like I'm the only one on the planet. As for me, you are, he said. At least you're the only one I'm interested in. How long do we have? At least two days, I said. Maybe three. We ran up the stairs, and he grabbed me at every step. When we got to the top, he followed me into the bedroom. When we finished, I did what experience should have taught me to avoid. I let him talk. So, is the car in the garage? He asked. No, I answered. He drove it to the airport. Does that upset you? Well, no, he said, disappointment coloring his words. And to think I thought you only wanted my body. But I'm starting to think you really want to get to my husband's car. No, he said quickly. It would just be fun. You always say he never lets anyone drive it. 
It would be another thing he shares with me without knowing it. The ringing of the phone interrupted our conversation. I grabbed my phone from the table next to the bed. After a short conversation, I turned to him and told him to get out. I thought I was staying a couple of days, he whined. Both my mom and my mother-in-law are heading here, I said. And none of them are stupid. I'll call you when I get back. We're going shopping. He got dressed and left without a word. I spent the day spending Clint's money and hearing two old ladies tell me how much Clint loved me. My sense of guilt grew with every statement they made. I ended up having dinner in town with my mother's after we finished shopping. As usual, my guilt led me to buy more Christmas gifts for Clint than I had planned, and I again thought about our future together. I don't think I really knew what I wanted. I had no idea if I loved Clint. All I knew was that I loved the lifestyle his work gave us, and whether I loved him or not, I wasn't ready to give it up. I'm very attached to Clint, and I never want to hurt him. I thought again that maybe divorcing him would be the kindest thing I could do. But then I decided again that divorcing him would be stupid. Neither of us wants this. Clint loves me with all his heart, divorce would only hurt him, and it would hurt me. At 35, I was no longer a young girl. I've seen how bad things are for most women I know after divorce. Most of them end up failing in many ways. They become prey for men who use them only for a night and rob them of much of their dignity. They also go from managing 100% of a man's income to managing maybe 40%, if they're lucky. Most of them end up losing their homes and having to find work. I felt great pity for those who were married. They usually put up with a lot of crap just to keep a man who was never as good as their first husband. The only reason they did it was that it was better than being alone. Those who never remarried were the most miserable. They became lonely old women with a house full of cats who dreamed of spending the night looking after their grandchildren. Even if I divorced Clint, other than unhappiness, what would it bring me? Kyle? Damn, I'm not that stupid. First of all, I don't like Kyle. I just love the attention he gives me. Kyle, even at 27, is not fit to wear my husband's sweatpants. He has no job, no prospects, and never went to college. There's no way he could ever support me. Kyle dreams of becoming the next successful white rapper. I've heard him rap, and he's terrible. I don't know anything about hip-hop music, but I know it's not good. If I had my back against the wall, I could probably beat Kyle in a rap battle. The second reason I don't like him is that I'm not stupid. I know that, despite his protests, the main reason Kyle is with me is for the money I give him. Of course, Intim is a part of it, and he takes it because I give it to him. But Kyle doesn't love me any more than I love him. I was lost in my thoughts for so long that I didn't notice the time passing, so it came as a surprise when my mother-in-law mentioned how late it was already. We better get you home so you can be there when Clint calls, she said. My mother agreed. In fact, Clint could and should have already called me on my cell phone, even if it was just a quick call to let me know he had arrived. When I returned home, he still didn't call me. I started to worry. I went through everything in my head. We didn't quarrel, and he kissed me as if he didn't want us to separate that morning. He even asked me to go with him. As far as I knew, he wasn't mad at me, so why didn't he call? At that moment, my cell phone rang, and I quickly answered. Darling, why didn't you call for so long? I was so worried, I said into the phone. You told me not to call, Kyle replied stupidly. I'm outside freezing. May I come in? Clint had never gone this long without talking to me before, especially when he was away. I tried to think of reasons why he might not call, but I couldn't find any. Canada was not a third world country without telephone service. Maybe he found out about Kyle? I didn't think it was like that. Clint was an honest man. If he had found out about Kyle, he would have confronted me, and everything would have come out. He just loved me too much to play games. The only thing I could come up with was that he immediately went to meet new clients, and they treated him to food, causing him to lose track of time. I opened the door and called out to Kyle, who was hiding in the bushes outside, shivering and freezing. As soon as he slid inside, I noticed that my neighbor Ethel was watching me like a hawk. I'd have to come up with a good excuse for what she saw before Clint got back. Kyle immediately entered the house and began taking off his clothes. 
I decided to put my worries about Clint aside until the next day. However, no matter how hard I tried, I could not enjoy intimate with Kyle. Deep down, I knew something was wrong. After a while, Kyle gave in and started talking. So your husband thinks you're upset about him leaving, he laughed. Yes, I replied, trying to keep the conversation to a minimum. What a fool, said Kyle. Yes, I echoed, what a fool. Imagine this idiot loves me so much that he hates leaving me. He even begged me to go with him. How stupid must he be to love someone like me? Very stupid, Kyle agreed, not realizing I was being sarcastic. He doesn't even understand that you love me and not him. I laugh every time I think about how he works to buy you things and give you money so you can give it to me. It's like he's paying me to sleep with you. I fell silent after his words, and even Kyle realized what he had done. Of course I'd sleep with you for free, he said, trying and failing to correct his mistake. Oh, I would even pay money to have an intim with you, he blurted out. If only I had money. I think we both knew it was a lie. Okay, let's figure it out, I said. Do you think I'm a woman who will take money for a night? So you think I'm an easy girl? No, darling, this is not where I was going, he muttered. So where were you going? I asked, with a growing realization of how much of a fool I had been. As soon as I get a record deal, I'll take you out of here, he said. It'll be you and me against the world, darling. I think that's when I realized how big of a fool we both were. I knew for sure that if Kyle ever received more than $10, he would immediately spend it on some 20-year-old girl without hesitation. He was a fool for not realizing that I knew him better than he did. At the same time, I was also a fool. I had everything I ever dreamed of, but I risked it all every time I let that fool between my legs. In that moment, in the dark with this emotionally immature forever child in my husband's bed, I finally realized how broken I was. I understood why Kyle was there. He was just a way for me to get back at Clint for not putting me first in his life. I was too much of a coward to really confront Clint about it. I didn't want him to quit his job and find another one that would give him more time for me, especially if it might not pay as well and would end up forcing me to get a job to help out. No, it was much less brave but much easier to just express my disappointment by letting someone else have what Clint thought was his only one Delilah. When the plane took off, I panicked. I'd never flown on such a small plane before, usually, I preferred to go by car. I hated flying, and when I absolutely had to fly, it was usually on a large commercial airliner. However, this time it was impossible. I was returning home to visit my last remaining relative, Aunt Alice. I spent Thanksgiving with her at her nursing home. She didn't look very good. Maybe I should think about moving her back to Michigan. My Aunt Alice was also the only one of my relatives who didn't judge me when she found out what I was doing. My job, or career, or whatever you want to call it, was what got me on that little plane. I was heading to Toronto for a temporary job. For me, temporary jobs were very rare. I primarily served what I considered a niche market. No one was more shocked than I was that I was able to make money from this. There seems to be nothing more diverse in tastes, especially nowadays. 20 years ago, I would have had no chance. However, today, it seems that everyone not only allows but also indulges their inner quirks. The plane began to shake and vibrate as it left the ground. There was also a not-so-distinct metallic sound as we tried to gain altitude. Was this normal? I didn't think so, but no one else seemed to notice. It reminded me of the sound my car made right before it broke down. My panic increased, and I grabbed the life preserver. I was used to the reaction my body caused. This was one of the reasons why I tried not to draw attention to myself. They say that we live in an enlightened age. Women have more rights than ever. Women can own businesses, and we're very close to being paid equally to men in most industries. In some, we even earn more. If a woman works in a company and experiences stares or any inappropriate behavior, basically anything that makes her feel uncomfortable, she can file a complaint with the HR department and accuse the company or a specific person of intimate harassment. It's funny, but even though a woman is safer in the workplace, she can still be attacked and insulted on the street in public. From the moment I boarded the plane, I was under surveillance. Most of the men there, and even a few women, openly stared at me. I was used to this for men, 
but women made my skin crawl. They say that women have a kind of radar about their bodies and what parts they look at. It felt like there were at least a dozen small insects crawling across my chest. I felt it. I turned my head and met the gaze of the predator. I had met many such men in my life. He was clearly the type of person who would try to use me as a piece of meat and nothing more. I looked around and found the opposite right in front of me. I met the softest, kindest brown eyes I'd ever seen. He also looked at me, but his gaze was different. Although it was obvious he appreciated my body, he seemed guilty about it, and there was something else in that look. It was not only warm but also caring, indicating he wasn't the kind of person who would force me or anyone else. Even as the predator jumped to his feet and walked toward me, I moved toward safety and sat next to him. Up close, his eyes were even more welcoming, and what he did next couldn't have been better, even if I had written the script myself. He offered me a seat by the window and positioned his body between me and the wolf. I felt as if I were in a cocoon of warmth and protection. However, as quickly as it started, it ended. He seemed to be immersed in some kind of internal conflict, or maybe he was just shy and didn't want to invade my personal space. I wondered if it might just be his style, the lone knight who makes random saves and then disappears. I had something to think about, so I let the thought go. It only lasted four seconds until the plane took off and I heard that clang. I grabbed his hand with all the strength I could muster, wrapping my arm around his, pinning my hand between his muscular arm and his very thin chest. Unfortunately, it was tit for tat, as his muscular arm was sandwiched between my soft, meaty upper arm and my even softer chest. He instantly realized where his hand was and froze. I almost thought his eyes would roll back in his head. I'm scared, I said through chattering teeth. What he did next was amazing. He untangled our hands but held onto mine, his grip gentle yet firm. Don't be afraid, he said, beaming the biggest smile. I was sure that if there was a chance, I could get lost in those eyes. But what did I know? At 47 years old, I had only been in love once, and he had two left feet. Flying is the safest way to travel, he said. If that's the case, why is it that when a car gets into an accident, only one or two cars are damaged and most people come out of it unscathed? But when a plane crashes, everyone on board looks like their bodies have been put through a meat grinder, and the damage spreads across three counties? You're exaggerating, he smiled. Besides, we won't fall. I think we just hit a few air pockets. Usually, it's only difficult during takeoff and landing, the rest of the flight will be so smooth that you won't even notice we're moving through the air at over 300 miles an hour in a beer can with wings. I spat out, this thing is made of aluminum. Remember 20 years ago when beer cans were made of steel? Back then, you had to be a very strong man to crush the can. Now, even little girls can crush one. Why the hell do they make planes out of something so fragile? I was so excited that I let my hands move in all directions as I spoke, making my breasts jiggle. Within moments, all the men around us, especially the wolf and his pups, were looking at me. I'm Clint, he said softly. I promise I won't let anything happen to you. Delilah, I said, returning his smile. I'm going to hold you to your word. He told me about his trip and what he was doing on this flight. He talked about his business and, unfortunately, his wife. As we sat holding hands, the plane cutting through the air like an aluminum rocket, all my fears evaporated. I was no longer afraid, but I wasn't going to let go of his hand. I lived in the moment and had no intention of letting it go. Despite what I did in life, I was always a good girl. However, I was ready to let it all go if this man asked me to join the Mile High Club. I didn't care that he was married or anything. For more than an hour, I was content to just listen to him. He made me laugh and feel special, but most of all, for the first time in as long as I could remember, a man made me feel like more than just a pair of big breasts. The amazing thing was that after we started talking, his eyes never left mine. He mentioned my blue-green eyes several times during our conversation, and every time he did, I felt a shiver between my legs. I almost got angry when the flight attendant, or whatever she called herself, interrupted us to tell us that we were on schedule and would be landing in an hour. She informed us that a storm was approaching, and although the plane was flying fast enough to outrun it, we would probably need warm clothes during our stay in Canada. I noticed that during the entire conversation, 
Her eyes constantly moved from my breasts to his eyes. She clearly didn't know if she wanted to have an intimate with him or me. Hell, maybe she wanted both of us. I rejected her with one of those rude hand gestures. It wasn't something I usually did, but I wanted to enjoy every moment with Clint. Even the air felt sparkling. It was one of those perfect moments that fate gives us once or twice in our lives. As soon as she walked away in anger, the wolf returned. Hey, baby, you should look at the view from the other side of the plane, he said. For what? I asked. Isn't this side flying over the same land? Well, yes, he said, but maybe the company would be better. I doubt it, I replied. You know my eyes are up here. They have a strange structure, my eyes are above my neck on my face. Think about it. Or better yet, just go back to your seat. She must be into women, he spat, addressing no one in particular. Oh good, the flight attendant said happily. She winked at me before I could express my disgust. There was another one of those clanging noises I had heard earlier, but this time it was so loud that everyone heard it. Suddenly, the plane veered sharply to the left and fell a long distance before leveling off. But even as the plane tried to return to its correct position and altitude, we heard several more bangs and clanks, and noticed through the window that fire was engulfing the jet engine attached to the left wing. Everything went wrong. I couldn't focus on my own thoughts because some woman was screaming at the top of her lungs. Clint covered my mouth with his hands to let me know that I was the one screaming. The plane began to rock, first one way, then the other, and it was clear that we were falling, and falling quickly. I was still screaming, and Clint stopped listening to me. He looked at everything around us, grabbed my hand in an iron grip, and pulled us forward two rows. Please, sir, sit down, the flight attendant shouted. Clint pushed us into the row of seats he was watching. He pulled out a couple of pillows from somewhere and bent me forward. Keep your head down, Delilah, he said calmly. He squeezed my hand and smiled at me. I was terrified. I was ready to scream again, but he did something that shocked me even more than the fact that I was about to die. He kissed me. Amidst all this turmoil of approaching death, my mind recorded this kiss before I had time to realize it. He sharply tilted my head down and threw himself on top of me. The plane hit something, and there was a sound like a thousand explosions at once. Metal could be heard tearing, and the world around us turned upside down. The floor suddenly became the ceiling and then the floor again. The seats in front of us were compressed from the pressure of the impact and the inertia of the seats being pushed forward. Between the crew, flight attendants, and passengers, there were probably about 20 people on board the plane. They all seemed to be screaming at the same time. The final blow was so strong that it knocked the wind out of me, and then everything went dark. KD. I woke up in the middle of the night. The room was completely dark, and a loud noise was heard. It was coming right next to me. Once I shook off the drowsiness and brain fog, I realized it was Kyle. He snores louder than a lawnmower. His snoring would be funny if I didn't have to try to sleep through it. I also realized something else. They say body language is everything. Our involuntary habits and movements are windows into our true feelings, they are believed to be a better barometer of what we think and feel than what we say, and sometimes even more accurate than what we think. In my sleep, Kyle rolled over as far away from me as possible, and I also turned away from him. Clint always ended up with his arms wrapped around me, even when we were fighting or not talking to each other. We somehow fell asleep in each other's arms. I always felt so safe and warm when we slept together. No matter what we argued about, it never seemed so important after the night we spent together. At that moment, I realized that I felt lonely and worried. Why the hell should I feel alone with this six-foot piece of meat next to me? Maybe it was a message from my subconscious that Kyle meant nothing to me. I sat in the dark, trying to figure out what I wanted and where my life had gone wrong. When I married Clint, I was sure that I loved him, and I think deep down I still love him. I just hate being second to his damn job. I know he thinks he needs to work so hard so we can have everything we want. He also needs to make sure we have enough money and resources to retire comfortably. However, in truth, I would prefer that he work less or find a job that gives him more free time so that we can spend more time together. If he could do that, there would be no more Kyle. Another thing I had to consider was that, in truth, I had been less than fair to Clint. 
It wasn't hard for me to tell him when I wanted him to buy me something or take me somewhere, but I never once told him how I felt about his work. I think this is because, to some extent, men tend to identify with their work. A man's work means a lot to how he sees himself. Women tend to identify more with marriages and families. So maybe I was afraid that if I told Clint that he had to choose between me and Frank, I might not like the answer. I also wondered if this was actually fair. Clint spent every free moment with me. I have a lot of activities to fill my time. I have many friends and things that I do for fun outside of work. Poor Clint has only two interests. I'm in first place, and his Mustang is in second. Clint loves this car. He never lets anyone touch her. A tear rolled down my cheek in the darkness. He loves this stupid car so much. He worked hard to earn the money to buy it, but he didn't even think about buying it until he bought me the car I wanted. It was his choice, and he chose to buy my car first, regardless of his work. This stupid man loved me. Okay, maybe he loved his job a little too much, but he loved me more than anything else in the world. Why didn't I notice this? Was I really just a spoiled brat, as my parents often claimed? And I was all too ready to hand over the keys to Clint's Mustang to Kyle. This would be a huge mistake. Clint can feel a piece of lint that fell on this car five miles away. I think he would have immediately realized that someone was in that car. He probably also knew the exact mileage on that car's odometer. Letting Kyle drive this car would mean the end of my marriage. Is this what I wanted? I think, even subconsciously, I didn't want Clint to disappear from my life. I started sleeping with Kyle to get back at Clint for choosing his job over me. Now it seems stupid and childish. It sounded more like the act of a teenager who gets a tattoo because her parents hate tattoos. But the big, ugly tattoo doesn't really hurt her parents. She will have to hide it for the rest of her life. I sat in the darkened room, silently crying, wondering again where Clint was and why he didn't call me. This had never happened before, and again I wondered if he somehow found out about Kyle. I reached out in the dark and hit Kyle. He woke up, mumbling and confused. Go sleep on the couch, I said. Your damn snoring keeps me awake. I don't snore, he said. Damn you snoring. I said. It was like being on a construction site here. Well, sleep excites me, he said. I can't help it. I decided at that moment that Kyle had to go. We could make our last night together memorable. Well, Kyle, I can help you with this, I said gently. I woke up in a nightmare. At first, I was confused. I had no idea where I was or how I got here. It was very cold, and it looked like it was snowing. Something underneath me was very warm and very soft. I tried to straighten up, but something heavy prevented me from doing so. It seemed to be very heavy and made noise when I moved. I think I could have pushed it up, but it was smarter to get out from under it. I tried to crawl out and realized that the warm and soft thing underneath me was a person. Suddenly, I remembered everything, the plane crash. I remained calm. I was alive and could still think. I tried to remember everything that happened and realized that I could do it. This was a good sign. This meant there was probably no brain damage or concussion. I carefully moved and flexed both arms, starting from the shoulders and then to the elbows, wrists, and finally the hands and fingers. Other than a few cuts and abrasions, I had no pain in my arms and had full functionality. Then I did the same with my legs and feet. Everything seemed intact. I took a more thorough inventory and discovered that my biggest complaint was terrible pain in my upper back. I could still move the muscles there, and like I said, I still had full functionality in all my limbs. It must have been a large cut or bruise from something that fell on me. I remembered how I covered Dahlia with myself when the plane fell, the large structure of the overhead luggage compartment fell on me. I crawled out from under her and turned to Dahlia. Dahlia, are you okay? I asked. I think so, she said sleepily. I'm cold, and my leg hurts a lot. I'm so sorry, honey, I said. I'll get you out of here as soon as I'm sure we're safe. I stood up and looked around. It was dark, and my eyes slowly adjusted to the lack of light. Several small lights helped with this. I noticed that the plane had broken into several pieces, either on impact or during the violent vibrations that followed. I remembered moving Dahlia and myself several rows ahead of our seats. 
Now I'm glad I did. I read somewhere about the safest places during a plane crash. I moved us to one of these places. It paid off. The section of the plane we were in was fairly intact. However, everything ahead of us was like an accordion after a blow. In cars, this is called the crumple zone. This is an area at the front of the car that is designed to fold down to absorb the impact of a collision and protect the occupants. The plane wasn't designed that way, but the front of the plane and everyone in it died to protect us from the impact. In this zone of incredible destruction, nothing moved. All I saw was mangled metal. I could barely make out a few torn body parts among the chaos, and then I saw her. It was the flight attendant who told Dahlia and me that we would land in an hour. Her body was severely mutilated and crushed, her face was torn apart. And through all this horror, one I met mine. Her mouth moved as if she was trying to say something, and then the sparkle in that I went out. She looked without focus into nothingness, her pain was clearly over. The plane's skin broke, and snow fell thickly into the plane. I felt something else, it was a pungent and familiar smell. It smelled like gas. Hell, it's probably jet fuel. With the fire burning, it was very likely that it was only a matter of time before parts of the plane began to burn or explode. I looked at Dilia. Dilia, we have to get out of here, I said. I like it better when you call me sweetheart, she said. I grabbed her arm and tried to pull her out from under the luggage compartment, and I heard her scream, Clint, stop. My leg is stuck. I knelt down and began to examine her left leg. I felt her leg from thigh to foot. She was free until the very end. It's not the leg that hurts, but you can do it any time, she said. I'm sorry, I replied. I was just trying to understand what was going on. To tell you the truth, you didn't say which leg hurt, so I started with the closest one. Despite the pain, she simply smiled at me. I began to examine the other leg and realized that her lower leg, from knee to ankle, was stuck between the seat we were sitting on and the seat in front of us. There was no way to free her without moving that seat or cutting off her leg. At the same time, the smell of volatile jet fuel became stronger and stronger. It was only a matter of time before the part of the plane we were in caught fire. Crap! I shouted. I think you need to free my leg first, she chuckled. We would enjoy it more that way. Haha, I laughed. What a sense of humor. Who's kidding? I looked around to find something useful. There must be an emergency toolkit somewhere. I didn't find anything, and then I noticed one of the destroyed seats. The frame was made of fairly strong steel tubes. I knocked one of them out and returned to Dilia. I inserted its end between the seats and applied force, pushing the two seats apart. It worked, and just in time, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that the opposite side began to smoke, and small tongues of flame were licking the lining of the walls. We need to get out of here, I said. I applied more force, pushing the seats apart, and suddenly the tube in my hand bent under the tension, and the two sections separated. Dilia's sudden gasp let me know it was painful. I ran back to the destroyed seat. This time, I grabbed two tubes. Dilia, this is the last chance, I said. I know your leg hurts. We don't know if it's dislocated or even broken but you have to move it no matter how painful it is. The plane will soon catch fire, and we will either get you out of here or burn with it. So as soon as I do this, you have to take your leg out. If I can't take it out, you can still leave, she said sadly. Not an option, I replied. I promised you that nothing would happen to you, and I meant it. So get ready to move your foot. This time, I inserted both tubes into the gap. I threw all my weight against them, and the gap between the seats increased. With a loud scream, Dilia pulled her leg out as one of the tubes broke and the other bent. Come on, Dilia, we must leave. I shouted as the flames approached us. She could barely step on her foot, so I stood in front of her and carried her on my back to the open end of the plane. The section of the plane was at least ten feet above the ground, and the gaping hole we were going to use as an exit had no smooth surfaces only sharp sheets of metal. I grabbed a piece of carpet and pulled it toward the hole. Sit on it. I shouted. I'll jump, then you slide down, and I will catch you to help you land. Try to keep your sore leg off the ground. I didn't give her a chance to answer. 
I jumped into the darkness. There were also small lights on the ground. We were in a dense forest, and I saw large pieces of the plane scattered throughout the area. As soon as I landed, I extended my hand toward her. She slid to the edge and then fell into my arms. The tension was quite strong. She was not a little girl. This applies to me too, said a voice behind us. God must care about the mans, Dilia whispered. As soon as I got Dilly on her one good leg, the section of the plane we were on caught fire. I grabbed Dilia and practically dragged her away from the plane until we were at a safe distance. What's wrong with her? asked a loud-voiced guy. That's her leg, I said. She can't walk on it. Damn, this sucks, he said. It's a pity to lose such breasts. You can't lose what you never had and what you'll never get, Dilia shot back. He simply shrugged and turned away from us. We can handle it, he said, and walked to another part of the plane where his minion and several other people were waiting. There were two other men and one woman standing there, and another flight attendant tending to another man who appeared to be injured. I noticed that they had time to plunder their part of the plane. The only thing I didn't see was the tail of the plane. I assumed that when the plane hit the ground and broke up, it landed nose first, and the rear of the plane was thrown further out. I noticed that several bodies were lying on the ground and that a group of survivors had torn off their clothes and were wearing them for additional protection from the cold. One of the men returned inside the section of the plane from which they had come. He called from the PL's doorway, and one of the other men followed him inside. Apparently, he found something else that could be useful to them. Clint, I heard Dahlia scream. I turned around and noticed that the loud-voiced guy had approached her again. I headed back to them, they seemed to be having a heated conversation. Hey, buddy, the man said with a big smile. Have you talked to my people? Are you thinking of coming with us? Stop lying, you an idiot, Dahlia fired back. He wants you to go with them because you are strong and can probably make it. He thinks that I should stay here with that disabled person on earth since neither of us will be able to go as far as he thinks we need to. He also wants to sleep with me before you leave. I was just being logical, the loud-voiced man said. Those of us who are in good shape should go that way. He pointed in the direction the plane was flying. And just leave them here. I asked, listen, buddy, this is Canada. Anyone who stays here will freeze to death long before anyone comes to save us. We were on a small private jet, the pilot was the owner of the company, and one of the flight attendants was his wife. Everyone who worked for the company was on board. Nobody is looking for us. We are also stuck in the wilderness, there is no mobile phone signal here. We can't call to be picked up. As you heard on the plane, there's a big winter storm coming. The plane was flying at about 300 miles per hour, so it was ahead of the storm. The snow will start to get thicker at any moment. If we don't start moving, we'll all die. People who can't keep up with us will only slow everyone down. This is nature, survival of the fittest and all that. What does this have to do with you wanting to sleep with me? Dahlia asked. I just thought that, he stammered. Damn, look at her. Do you even know who she is? We'll be fine on our own, I said. Just as you know, he said, just as an explosion rocked the section of the plane his friends had just entered. We all turned when we heard screams from inside, but the screams suddenly stopped. Can we take some of those clothes you stole from the other passengers? I asked. Dahlia is cold. He just laughed in my face. You guys are going to freeze to death, he said. Why would I waste clothes that survivors could use? Besides, she must be used to walking around without clothes. To hell with you. Dahlia spat. Anytime, anywhere. He smiled back. The woman and the other surviving man approached him. It's starting to snow, the woman said. And Josh finally died, the man added. We have to get out of here, boss. See you later, he said, and the three of them began to leave without looking back. You probably should have gone with them, Dahlia said. You could easily keep up with them. Why? I asked. We were almost 300 miles from our destination when the plane crashed. They're not going to go 300 miles. I noticed that we were flying over a group of small houses when the plane began to fall. They can't be more than a few miles behind us. Come on, we need to hurry. 
while I was talking to this idiot, I noticed that the tail of the plane was over there. Why should we go there? She asked. That's where all the supplies on the plane are stored, I replied. I turned my back and knelt in front of her, then stood up and carried her further into the forest. It was farther than I thought, and the snow was starting to accumulate. When we finally got there, I climbed into the back of the plane, everything was in disarray. I kicked in the inner door because the handle was broken in the accident. I found several shelves full of blankets, grabbed a few, and carried them outside for Dahlia to hide under while I continued to search. I then found supplies and took one of the blankets, loading it full of first aid supplies and frozen meals that were served on the plane. I loaded as much as I could carry, along with plenty of soft drinks and water bottles. I also grabbed a few small bottles of liquor and took a couple of emergency kits with flashlights and a few tools. I tied the corners and secured the blanket into a knot that I could carry, then left the damaged part of the plane. I took it all back to Dahlia. I found a damaged piece of metal skin on the plane and was able to bend it until one end formed almost a right angle. I threaded the strap through the rivet hole at the other end, doing it twice to make it stronger. I then threaded one of the blankets through the belt, laid out several blankets on a makeshift sled, and placed Dahlia on the sled. I wrapped her in the rest of the blankets and placed the pack supplies on the sled. Try to sleep, I told her. Are you warmer? She simply nodded. I pulled her on the sled back to where the rest of the plane was, then started walking in the direction the plane had come from. Dahlia talked to me as I walked. The effort kept me warm for the first part of the trip, but my hands started to get cold. I stuffed them into my jacket pockets and continued walking. After an hour or so of walking, I started to get tired. Dahlia had fallen asleep shortly before. She was exhausted from everything we had been through. The last thing she said to me before she fell asleep was, Thank you for everything you did for me. I wanted to take a break. It was strange. I usually went for a run every day and could run five or six miles without much effort. However, while pulling the sleigh, I seemed to lose strength before we had gone even two miles. I knew that if I sat down and took a break for even a few moments, I wouldn't get up again. If I died there in the snow, no one would ever know what happened to me. What would happen to Dia? What would happen to Katie and my family at home? Thoughts of my family kept my legs moving long after I was ready to give up. Finally, I saw them, a group of small houses about half a mile from where I was walking. They were to my left, which made me think I had turned right as I walked. If I had walked straight, I probably would have reached them by now. If I had turned any further to the right, I would almost certainly never have seen them. In the distance, I heard some kind of animal cry. I headed toward the houses. When I finally reached them, I saw a fence surrounding the complex. There were two gates, the big one for cars was locked, but the small one for pedestrians could be opened by simply snapping it into place. I pulled the sleigh through the gate into the first house I saw. The place turned out to be some kind of hunting lodge that was abandoned. The cabin I chose wasn't the largest, but it seemed the most complete. The front door was locked, so I returned to the largest building, which seemed to be an office. I knocked down the door, the rotting wood made it easy. Behind the table, as I had hoped, there was a board with the keys to all the houses. I took the keys to house number six and returned. I opened the door and pulled Dia inside. The house had a fireplace but no wood. I walked around the rest of the houses and found only a few small pieces, but behind the main house, I found a large pile of firewood. The top wood was already wet. I took as much wood as I could carry and brought it back to cabin number six. I stacked the wood in the fireplace and unpacked the blanket in which our supplies were wrapped. In one of the emergency kits, I found several matchboxes. I found some old newspapers in the cabin and layered them with firewood. I set fire to the newspapers, and soon we had a good fire. I dragged Dia closer to the fire. There was a sofa there, so I pulled her closer to it. I placed one of the blankets on the sofa and laid Dia down on it. Using one of the flashlights, I examined her ankle, it was swollen. I felt it carefully and did not notice any significant differences between it and the uninjured ankle. I wrapped her ankle with an elastic bandage from one of the medical kits. I was wondering when you'd get around to it, she said. I was trying to see if your knee was as badly damaged as your ankle, I said. So you don't like my legs? She grinned. Of course I do. 
I mean, no, I, your legs are fine. I just wanted to see if your knee was hurt, I stammered. Her face smiled at me, and she shook her head. Where are we? Where do we get all these things from? I'm still a little cold, but I'm not freezing to death. Clint, you are a savior, she said. I let her hold the flashlight while I examined her knee. Unlike the ankle, the knee was not swollen, it was only bruised. Based on the sprains I had suffered while running and playing other sports, I estimated that the knee would be better in three to four days. The ankle would take a week before she could put any weight on it. Dia yawned and took off her jacket. I gave her a can of juice, and she started drinking it while I added another log to the fire. I figured we would need a few extra logs throughout the night to stay warm, so I set the alarm for three o'clock. I just wish we had something to put in this juice, she said. After everything we've been through, we deserve it. I went to the package and placed it outside on the front porch. The food was wrapped in plastic bags, so even if any animals could get over the fence, I didn't think they could smell it. I took a small bottle of liquor with me, walked over to the couch, and took a can of orange juice from Dia. I poured vodka into it and returned it to her. Then I took off my shoes, grabbed a blanket from the pile, and stretched out in front of the fire. A few minutes later, I was lying on the big comfy couch with her under a blanket in front of a softly burning fire as the snow piled up outside. I died, falling asleep from fatigue, and wondered how the loud-voiced man and his group were doing. Morning came, and Kyle reappeared in my room, without anything. Okay, okay, I said, and the next moment he tried to have a night with me. When he hit me, my thoughts were elsewhere. Two days after Thanksgiving meant it was the end of the month. This meant that Kyle's rent had to be paid, and since I did not give him money, he tried to earn money for rent. I usually expected mindless, emotionless intimate from him, but this morning, my thoughts were elsewhere. It was Saturday, so the office was closed, but as if to confirm how incompatible we were, the phone rang. Kyle, get away from me! I growled. I need to answer the phone. I reached out to the table by the bed and managed to grab the phone just before it went to the answering machine. Hi Katie, it's Frank, he said. My heart sank. Have you heard anything from Clint? No, I haven't, I replied. Look, Katie, I didn't want to send him away on such short notice, especially during the Thanksgiving holiday. But you know I consider Clint like a son, and when a father has an idea, his son must implement it. When I leave the business, it will all pay off. I almost went into shock. Clint always told people that someday he would be in charge, but I think he believed he would be a manager or managing president, not that the business would be his. What about your daughter? I asked. I love my daughter, he said. I will leave all my personal assets to her. She will be very rich, but it took me a lifetime to build this business. Sally will just sell it, so I'm leaving my money to her but I'm leaving the business to someone who loves it as much as I do. Perhaps one of your children can inherit it. I hope the son will be named after me. That was a hint, but please don't tell Clint about any of this. In any case, if he calls you, tell him to contact me immediately. I'll tell him, Frank, but do you have any idea why he didn't call me or you? I asked. I talked to these Canadian guys on the phone several times. They're workaholics, and our Thanksgiving is not a holiday for them. If Clint met them as soon as he got off the plane yesterday, they probably met all evening and all night. Clint likely figured he could wrap things up faster and get home to you. With luck, he can already fly home. I sent him on a private business jet. Frank, I have another call, I said, interrupting him. I'll tell him to call you as soon as possible, and let's name the first boy Frank. Hell, if it's a girl, her name will be Frankie. As soon as I hung up, I turned to Kyle. Go away. I think Clint is already on his way home, I said. But what about, he began. Kyle, do you want to be pleased, or do you want rent? I asked. Why can't I have both, he whined. I love you so much. My new song is all about you. It's called Why Are You So Cold? I burst out laughing. Kyle, I know a lot of black people, and none of them actually talk like that, I said. I wrote him a check, gathered his things, and pushed him out the door, trying not to laugh. 
It could have been worse. He could have tried to perform it for me. I cleaned the house like a woman possessed. I needed to destroy all traces of Kyle before Clint returned. It was so like him to work all night just to get back to me. Another thought running through my head was that Frank was going to leave his business to us. We would become millionaires. Our retirement would be spent traveling the world and living in luxury. I decided to start working on the kids as soon as Clint returned. Later that evening, Frank called again. I told him I still hadn't heard from Clint. Katie, honey, I have bad news for you, he said. Did he call you? I asked excitedly. When will he come home? Katie, the plane hasn't landed, he said. He disappeared somewhere between Detroit and Buffalo Gap. I was shocked. I could barely concentrate on what he was saying. We don't know anything bad happened, he said. If there had been an accident or a plane crash, we would have known about it. We just have to be patient and wait for news. I called his parents and mine and told them what was happening. For the first week, I sat on the phone around the clock. Our parents, either Clint's or mine, were always with me. Frank called every day. A week later, life returned to normal. I was still in contact with the American and Canadian authorities, but there was no news. Then Kyle came to visit me. He obviously only returned because he needed the money, but I didn't care. I'm tired of being alone, Kyle told me. I missed you. I love you, and a week was too long for us to be apart. I claimed to have written several songs about us. I didn't care, I was just glad to have something to focus on other than wondering where my husband was. Kyle was with me when the plane was discovered. It had broken into three or four pieces when it hit the ground, with multiple fires and explosions either in the air or on the ground after the impact. They were checking the company's computer systems to find out how many passengers were on the plane that day. Due to recent bookings, there was no exact way to know. Clint was among those last bookings. We showed the authorities the receipt Frank had with the flight information as proof that Clint was on board. The official passenger list showed only 13 people on board, but if the latest reservations did arrive and were on the plane, there could have been 15 passengers or 20 people if you included the crew and two flight attendants. Including a body found on the ground near one of the plane's parts, there were 15 bodies. The authorities hoped that was all 15 official passengers, 15 bodies. This way, they could package everything neatly. DNA would still be needed for identification, but the whole thing would be complete. I cried for three days straight. Kyle was with me the whole time, and I no longer cared who saw him. Two days later, all hell broke loose. They found, purely by chance, something that forced them to resume their search. One of the teams traveling to help investigate the crash was a Canadian company. North of the crash site, on their way to the site, they came across three bodies. Two bodies were male, and the third was a woman. The woman was wearing a jacket with the airline logo. Apparently, three survived the crash and froze to death while trying to reach safety. The nearest town was more than 100 miles away. It was a stupid attempt, they would never have made it. One of the men died with his mouth open, as if he were still talking when death overtook him. Frank and I went to the site to identify the bodies. We had already seen all the bodies except those that were badly burned and needed DNA identification. Neither body was Clint. That night, after Intim, Kyle asked me when we would receive a check from the insurance company for Clint. I woke up the next morning and realized that the fire had gone out. My hand, the one on which the watch was, was under Delta. This explained why I didn't hear the alarm. Both my arms hugged her, it was a very intimate position, and I immediately felt guilty. Dia, wake up, I said. I'm not sleeping, she answered cheerfully. We need to get up, I said. No, no need. I feel warm and comfortable. Why should I go somewhere, she asked. She turned and looked at me. Her blue-green eyes were incredible. Our faces were so close to each other that it took all my self-control not to kiss her. Give me one reason why we need to get up, she said. Breakfast, I replied. Okay, that's a good reason, she said. Do we have breakfast? I nodded. And lunch and dinner too, if we are careful and eat two meals a day with chips or nuts for lunch. 
I estimate we have enough food to last us more than a week. I think your ankle will be healed by then. If no one finds us by then, we'll both go back to the plane and get more. That sounds like a plan to me, she said. Let's eat. I lit a fire and used the grate that was already there to heat up the ready-to-eat food. There were even a few plates in the kitchen. After breakfast, I explored the lodge. There was a sleeping loft that could be reached by stairs, but it was too far from the fireplace to be useful. There was no other source of heat in the house, so it looked like we would have to sleep by the fire. I was about to go to the other houses to explore when I discovered that we were covered in snow. I spent the rest of the day talking to Dia. Although the conversations were extremely superficial, the growing closeness between us was undeniable. Dia seemed to enjoy teasing me and testing my boundaries. We could talk about the most innocent topics, and she would just stare at me with her bluish-green eyes and say, You like me, don't you? Or when I told her that I needed to push through the snow to get more firewood before it ran out, she would really bug me. It's very cold there, she said. I know, I replied, but I can't let you freeze. You really can't, she said innocently. I made several trips and stacked enough wood right outside the door to keep us warm for a couple of days. Dia just smiled at me. Are you cold? She asked. Not really, I said. I think it worked, she said. I warmed you up a little so you wouldn't get cold while I collected firewood for us. Then she just started laughing for no reason. What's so funny? I asked. You got wood for me to collect wood for me, she laughed. I went out onto the porch and grabbed the blanket with all our supplies. I let her look at our dinner selections. She chose the meatloaf, and I chose the chicken parmesan, which looked delicious on the package. After dinner, I took one of the water bottles and used it to wash our dishes with the soap I found in the kitchen under the sink. I was glad we had a sink, it would be much better if we had running water. I haven't gotten off my butt all day except to limp to the back door to use the composting toilet, she said, but I'm tired. Are you going to sleep? I hesitated. Come on, Clint, she said. It's getting dark and we have nothing else to do, so throw a couple of logs on the fire and crawl under this blanket with me. We had a good talk before falling asleep. Dia told me her life story and didn't hide anything this time. I was completely wrong about her. She was not at all what I thought. Her father was a store owner who raised her to be a good girl. She married her high school sweetheart when they were both 18. He joined the army, and they decided to put off having children until he left the service and went to college. He extended his service another term to maximize his military benefits. Everything was going well, they bought a house and began preparing for his imminent return to civilian life. David had always been a very gentle but protective person. He was funny, shy, and very loyal to both her and his country. He was so clumsy that he could not dance to save his life. He always tripped over something or stepped on her feet when he tried to dance. She wore a beautiful dress with steel-toe work boots to their prom, and they danced, or tried to dance, all evening. Right before he took her home, with her parents' permission, he proposed to her. She loved him with all her heart and was sure he felt the same. He fell in love with her mind even before her body began to develop, and even when her body wasn't ideal for their age, he never wavered. When she sat at home dreaming of being taller and slimmer, he would simply laugh and say how glad he was that she wasn't like that. The day before he was to return home for good, he tripped and fell for the last time. The wire he tripped over ensured that he would never rise again. She was devastated. The fat, cheerful girl who had the world in the palm of her hand, who loved to plant flowers and dreamed of becoming a mother, never came back. She returned to her parents' home after selling the house. It took her almost four years to cope with his death and start functioning again. At 28, she got her first job as a waitress at a local restaurant. Over the years, she became a good waitress, but she never got used to the rude comments some customers made about her body, especially her breasts, which never seemed to stop growing. Some men were blatantly obvious in their desires, even trying to trick her. They would bet various amounts of money, claiming her breasts weren't real. What do you think of our first part of the story? In my opinion, this part of the story was quite interesting as we were introduced to the main plot. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.